One of the ways we sort of quantify heat and energy transfer in general is known as a as a technique known as calorimetry. It literally means measuring calories, right? Um, and in a very simple calorimeter, uh, what you'll have is you'll have a styrofoam cup and you'll put water in it and then inside the water you'll place a hot object like a metal or you might run a chemical reaction. So while it says metal here, it's just to make the the idea more tangible, this could also be a chemical reaction. And in a sense, when that's the chemical reaction, what we're studying, our system will be the chemical reaction, and the surroundings will be everything that's around the chemical reaction. So in this uh, example, though, if I take a piece of hot metal, right, and I stick it inside the calorimeter, uh, what do you expect to happen? Which way do you expect energy transfer to occur? Well, hopefully you're thinking right about hot being more energy, cold being lower energy. And heat energy is transferred typically from the high temperature object to the low temperature object. So energy transfer will be in the direction of the metal to the water okay so what happens to the temperature changes well the metal will be losing energy and so its temperature will go from high right to low and then the so that's for the metal it will be high to low and for the water it's going to go low to higher, right, in a sense, that it's going to go from a lower temperature to a higher temperature. Now, here's the thing to think about. In order for energy to transfer, thermal energy to transfer, there has to be a difference in temperature. So you've got this hot piece of metal, you've got this cold water, you stick the metal in the water, and what eventually happens, right? The water's warming up, and the metal's cooling down, and then the middle is where they meet somewhere. Now, it's not going to be dead set in the middle. It's going to be somewhere between the water's initial temperature and the metal's initial temperature. And that temperature is what we call thermal equilibrium. That means the water and metal will reach the same temperature. Now, let's think about that, right? Since the metal starts out hot and ends up at a low temperature, its change in temperature is going to have a negative sign to it. Now, temperature is a state function. And so basically, a negative temperature means it's, it ended at a lower temperature. For the water, because it's absorbing energy, it's delta T. It'll go from low temperature somewhere in the middle it'll have a positive sign, right? And it'll be absorbing energy. So just to summarize, right? You put an object in the in the water. If it's hot, hotter, it's a higher temperature than the water, then it transfers energy to the water. The change in temperature for the hotter, hot object will be, have a negative sign to it. The water will have a positive sign to its change in temperature. They'll meet somewhere in the middle, but not necessarily dead set in the middle. So, for example, if the metal's 100 degrees and the water's 20 degrees, uh, they're not going to be uh, meeting at 70 degrees, which is actually in the middle of those two, right? So it'll meet somewhere, but not exactly dead center in the middle. And we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. And the last thing is, eventually, everything comes to the same temperature, and we call that thermal equilibrium. So let's work on extending uh, what we understand a little bit more about systems and surroundings, okay? And we're going to look at how this uh, plays into conservation of energy. And, and again, I'm back to the statement of Q of the water plus the Q of the metal have to be equal to something. Now, if you consider that the metal is losing energy to the water, right, until they reach thermal equilibrium, and then the water picks up all that energy, right, my uh, system, what I'm studying is the metal, okay, this is my system, and then the water and everything else around it, that's my surrounding, 
right? The the heat loss of the system is all gained by the surrounding. Now think of it as the money analogy again, right? The system's throwing money out to the surroundings. The surrounding is collecting it up. And when you think about what this is equal to, this is equal to zero. Because the Q for the water is going to be the negative of Q of the metal, or the Q of the surroundings will be equal to the negative of the Q of my system. So what we can write because of conservation of energy, again, just back to this, Q of the metal is equal to negative of Q of the water. Now, if I want to study the energy transfer out of the metal, it turns out it's possible to understand how much energy was lost from the metal by looking at the energy that was gained by the water. Let me say that again. What I said was it's possible to understand, right, the energy lost by the metal by, at, by looking at the energy gained by the water. So in the analogy of money and my son, right, if you wanted to know how much money I lost in that transaction, you don't have to ask me how much I gave him. You can just ask my son how much he got. And he could tell you, oh, well, my dad gave me, well, 10 bucks or something, or $5 or something. Then you know that's, that's what I lost, okay? Now, this in the same way, we're going to use something called the heat capacity to identify the energy change of the water so that we could relate it to the energy change of the metal. Now having said that, I do want to re-emphasize that we're doing this because it's more tangible to understand. But for the most part, chemists don't sit around sticking metals in water. What we do is we do chemical reactions in water. and We really want to see the exchange of energy of the reaction, right? when it goes from reactants to products, and the way we're going to tell that is not by studying the chemical reaction and getting in between the molecules and trying to look at bonds formed and all that kind of stuff, all the complicated things. We're just going to see what happens to the water or the surroundings of the reaction, looking at temperature change, for example, in the water. Uh, so the equation that we're going to use is often called the MCAT equation. I think it's that because, you know, that's the same as the abbreviation for the medical college admissions test, right, the MCAT. Um, and it has, uh, when I tell people that this is the equation, I also tell them when the way I've written it out here is the way that I think you should always work out the problems uh, so that you can quickly identify the variables as you read the problem and then just rearrange the equation and calculate for the thing that you're looking for. But let's talk about what the variables mean. M is the mass of the substance that we're measuring the temperature change of. Delta T is the change in temperature. And because its temperature is also a state function, it's T final minus T initial. So if the temperature goes up, it's positive. If it goes down, it's negative. And C is something known as the specific heat. Now, there's a listing of, of specific heats of different subs substances on the right over here. And these are intensive properties. That is, if it's gold, it's going to have a specific heat at 0.128. Lead has a similar specific heat, although they are slightly different, although at three places they're not different. Um, but water has a specific heat of 4.18. Uh, sand and glass, even though right, glass is made from sand, right? Um, they have slightly different specific heats. So the form of the material matters, uh, what the material is. Compounds have specific heats, uh, typically a little higher than that of elements, as a matter of fact. And so what does it mean, right? Well, specific heats mean how much energy it takes, literally, if you look at the units. It's the joules it takes to raise one gram of the substance one degree Celsius. Joules per gram per degree Celsius, okay? So when you see this here, really there should be a parentheses on this side, like this. Should be a parentheses here to understand that the grams in the degree Celsius are at the bottom of uh, the, they're on the de denominator of the joule. Okay, so joules on the numerator and grams per degree Celsius is on the bottom. So having fixed that, um, one of the things to talk about is, um, 
what this means, right? It takes 4.18 joules to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius, but it only takes 0.128 joules to do the same for lead, one gram of lead. So it actually takes, like if you're heating a metal like lead or gold, compared to water, water takes like 33 times more energy to raise its temperature one degree Celsius. That's quite a bit more, right? Water is known to have a high heat capacity, okay, or specific heat. So this is known as specific heat. <laughs> Can't say it, sorry. And the units that we see in this table are joules per gram degree Celsius. And for water, that's 4.18 joules per gram, per gram, I did it myself, per gram times degree Celsius. Uh, but there's also could be in calories. A calorie is not an uncommon unit to see for this kind of work. And it's 4 point, sorry, it's 1.00 calorie, lowercase calorie, per gram degree Celsius. And the conversion, of course, between a calorie and a joule is 4.18, and it's not uh, coincidental that this value is 1 and this value is 4.18. Okay, anyways, let's look at a problem, and uh, we'll identify it as an MCAT problem, and then we'll go ahead and solve it. So here we have a gold ingot. It's 25 degrees Celsius, and it absorbs heat from the burning of one M&M. Now, an M&M, like the candy, right, has 3.4 kilocalories in it, kcals, or C A capital C-A-Ls in it. What would its final temperature be, right? So in order to do this, I'm reading a problem, and I have an initial temperature, right? That's T initial. And I have an energy, right? This is my Q. And this is my mass. So let's list out what we have. I have Q is equal to MC delta T. Um, I have my Q. That's 3.4 calories like that. And then I have a th mass is 31.1 grams. Uh, C I don't have. And delta T is what I'm looking for. Okay, that's what I'll be trying to find. So what are, where do I get C? I have to go back in the, a page and look at the specific heat of gold. Now, the specific heat of gold is 0.128 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, so I have a, a problem, right? Um, if you look at the energy units in calorie, it's in calories. Delta T is what I'm looking for. I, even though I know T final, I usually or T initial, I usually just write it like this, and I'll show you why I do that in a second. Um, let's see. So what am I going to do here, right? Hmm. Well, I have calories and I have joules, and those are not going to work out. So what I need to do is convert the calories into joules. So I'm going to write something like this using conversion factors that we had before. It's a thousand calories per calorie, which sounds weird when you say it. And then there's 4.184 joules per calorie. So then I can calculate uh, my energy, and that comes out to be, um, let's see here. So it's, I pulled out the calculator, i got to move it out of the way now. 3.4, right, times, oop, times 1,000, and then times 4.184, that's the conversion. I get 14,225 uh, joules, okay? So it's, let's call it 14,226 joules. Like when you see the energy in a in an M and M in that terms, it makes you think, oh, maybe I should eat M and M's. But you know, life's short, so just eat M and M's. That's kind of what I say. All right. So um, now what I need to do is I sol need to solve this for delta T. My units are all good, all right? So I'm going to say Q is equal to M C delta T, and I'm going to say delta T. 
is equal to Q over M times C, like that. And then I'll plug those values in. So I'm going to plug in, for example, 31.1 grams. And then I'm going to divide it by the mass. Oh, sorry. My bad. That's the Q, right? So that's 1,426. 14,226, I don't know where I got the number I just said, and then divide by 31.1 grams, and then times 0 0.128, and I left didn't leave myself enough room, joules per gram times degrees, degree Celsius, Sorry. like that. So what will happen is the grams will cancel like this, the joules will cancel like this, and this is 1 over 1 over C, so that will just invert and multiply that idea. And then you'll have energy uh, units of degrees Celsius. So delta T uh, comes out to be 3,630 degrees. And that's a lot. Right. So now think about it. Right. It started out at 25 degrees. Delta T is a positive 3600 degrees. So delta T is equal to T final minus T initial. And T initial is 25 degrees Celsius. So T final, we'll, I'll just solve it and you can do the math on your own. 3,361 and 61 degrees Celsius. Oh, sorry. 3,000. Oh, I think I have a, a calculation error. Let me double. Hey, there. So I fixed it. Sorry. I had an error in my calculation, which I spotted as I was writing it. It ends up being 3,655 degrees Celsius, which is actually above the boiling point of gold. So you can't actually reach that temperature. But that's how much energy is in one M&M. &M. Think about that. It's crazy. Now, if it had been water, right, what would have been the difference if it had been water and you were trying to heat it up? Well, the big difference would have been this number here, would have been 4.184. And if you plug that value in for water, it would have been just enough to get to over 100 degrees Celsius change. So it would have actually boiled 31 grams of water. Okay, so it's still quite a bit of energy in the M&M. &M. Which is probably a good thing that it takes a while to metabolize foods in our body. Otherwise, when they burn, you know, you would just burn up with it. All right, let's do another uh, example. So in this problem, we have a metal sample, and it's placed in water, and the following data are collected, is what that should say, collected. Not calculated. You don't calculate data. Um, what is the specific heat and identity of the metal? So we're asked to identify this unknown metal sample, right? And we heat it up, and we place it in water. So it starts off at a high temperature, and then it drops to a lower temperature. The water starts at the lower temperature, which makes sense, I guess, and heats up to the higher temperature. And they meet in between, and that's the T final for both the water and the metal. Now, if we want to find the specific heat of the metal, we're going to have to know a couple of things. And we're just write a note up here. Q for the metal is equal to M times C times delta T. And if we want to find this value, that means you have to have a Q for the metal, and you have to have the mass of the metal, and you have to have the change in temperature of the metal. Well, delta T for the metal can be gotten from these values here, right? So I'm going to call delta T for the metal like that. And then I have the mass of the metal, so I'm going to call it MM like that, which unfortunately means molar mass uh, if you're not thinking about it. But yeah, mass of metal. Um, the only thing I don't have is a specific heat and Q. So this is a situation where you're trying to figure out, right, something about this, but all the information that you, or some of the information that you need for that, um, something, the information that you need for finding that whatever it is about the metal comes from the water. Okay, so we're going to have to analyze the water in this case, and we're going to rely on conservation of energy, and you know that when you look at the energy gained by the water that's opposite of the energy lost by the metal. 
So that's the whole system surrounding. So I can write as a statement of conservation of energy that Q of the metal, or Q, let's do the Q of the water, is equal to the negative of the Q of the metal. Now, if I have that value, right, if I have this value, then all that's left to calculate is specific heat because I'll have gotten the metal from the uh, the data metal mass and I will also have gotten the change in temperature from there so let's take a look at what information we have to calculate Q for water so Q for water again it's M C and Delta T so my mass of my water is 42.83 grams the specific heat for water, C, is 4.18, I usually go with 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And delta T will be T final, I'm too low on the screen here, minus T initial. And then that's going to be, let's see, 27, oh, sorry, T final, yeah, 27.94 degrees Celsius minus 25.25 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's going to be uh, 2.69 degrees, I believe. Let's see, double check. Yeah, 2.69 degrees Celsius. So it's a temperature change. Um, it's positive because it's going up, right? So T final, my T initial should be a positive number. Some things to think about. So now we can calculate Q for the water. And the Q for the water is just going to be 42.83 grams times 4.184 uh, joules per gram degree Celsius times 2.69 degrees Celsius, like that. And I do the calculation, and what I'll get is a number uh, uh, that's 482.0 joules. Okay, so that's the, that's the energy change for the water. And what I can write then is that Q for the metal okay, is equal to negative 48. 2.0 joules and that's going to be equal to m right c and delta t for the metal this is all values for the metal so i'm going to continue my problem up here and i'm going to go ahead up here and i'm going to go ahead and rearrange the equation for c and then again i'll, I'll calculate all the variables that i need for um for solving for the specific heat so that's going to be Q of the metal divided by the mass of the metal times delta T for the metal. Now, Q for the metal, we already have. It's this number here, negative 482. So Q, negative 482.0 joules. The, um, the mass, right, is, let's see... 29.48 grams and then delta T is T final minus T initial so it's 27.94 degrees Celsius minus 97.50 degrees Celsius um, that comes out to be negative 69.8 can't read it there. I'll write it up here. Delta T, oh, out here. Delta T is going to be equal to negative 69.5. Can't read it. Negative 69.56 degrees Celsius, like that. So now what I need to do is plug those values into my equation. And since I'm out of space, I'm just going to leave that as an exercise to you. But when you do, plug all those values in. You notice that you have a negative here and you have a negative here, so those will cancel. And you'll end up getting 0 0.223 joules per gram 
degrees Celsius. So that's the specific heat of the metal. I have about three significant figures in my calculation, so I rounded it to three significant figures. Now to identify the metal, what we need to do is look at that specific heat and then go back to this table and look to see which one is closest to it. So right now it looks like that's probably silver. It's 2, 3, 5 for this and it's 2, 3, um, let me double check here. So I, I had a calculation error and I just caught it. So this is actually 0 0.235 joules per gram degree Celsius and then we can go back to the table and try to identify it, and it actually comes out exactly at silver. Now, originally, silver was like the closest one, so that would have been kind of an okay guess, but it wasn't really that close. And so, But then I went back and checked, and I saw that I had a calculation error. It should come out to be something that's on the list of uh, specific heats for metals. Okay, so um, anyways, again, this is the process. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of calculations in these problems, and none of them are actually that difficult but what makes them hard is you need to be really organized and write everything out otherwise you're going to lose track of which variables go to which part of the problem okay so to summarize what we did um, we looked at the information and identified that we needed to find the specific heat so that was the first thing that we did the second thing and again, that's what you do in all problems, right? Figure out what you're looking for. The second thing we did is I related this, the heat loss of the metal to the heat gain of the water. And then the third thing I did was I calculated the energy that was gained by the water uh, using the MCAT equation. Again, lining everything out, calculating my delta T carefully, plugging this all in and getting 482.0 joules. And that was the last piece of the puzzle. I had also somewhere in that process identified which things I needed in order to calculate C. So if I already had the mass and I already had the change in temperature and I was looking for C, it meant I had to find the Q of the metal, which I used a statement of conservation of mass, which basically says the heat right, lost by the metal, right, is the opposite of the heat gained by the water. So I just put a negative sign in here, and then I solved the equation uh, for the specific heat.